Okay, so this is the last lecture, if you will, for E2060 Fall 2013 in the sense that this is a review of suggested problems for the final exam. Uh, these problems highlight all the concepts that are going to be covered on the final exam. So the way I'll work this lecture is I will give a short introduction to the problem, pause the lecture, solve the problem, and then discuss it. So because I'm gonna, the lecture is going to be only 20 minutes long, so I really don't have time to like write out uh, the solution in detail and explain it as I'm writing it because it'll take too long. So let's look at uh, the problems in the sense that this is this problem is basically phasers. Uh, this is basically AC power. These two problems, 1126 and 1148. 1339 is ideal transformers. And the last three problems are frequency response. So the first problem is for the circuit shown, find the Norton equivalent at A, B. So let me, I've copied all the problems from the electronic version of the book here. So let me solve the problems by recopying this and going through it. But basically the concept behind the first problem is to find the Norton equivalent, we will find uh, basically equivalent resistance seen from the terminals AB and the short circuit current from A to B and that involves circuit analysis. So let me work on that. I'll pause the lecture and then get back to it. So in real time, I don't know how long it's going to take me to solve this. But in lecture time, when I pause it and then replay it, it should be like instantaneous. And as on your exam, you're not allowed cheat sheets if you didn't know. I did talk about this in lecture, but there are no cheat sheets. However, please bring your calculators. I will also post the solutions on my YouTube channel so you can access that is this video. You can access it without logging in to connect. And also on the YouTube channel, I'll make sure to put a link to the PDF of this from my server or on my server and I'll also mention it there that on the YouTube channel that for the final exam please do bring your calculators so anyway let me solve the first problem 1064 and then uh, I'll be back okay so continuing here is it took me around five minutes to solve this problem uh, so first thing to find Z bar uh, Z Tevenin Z bar Tevenin I just replaced the independent current source with an open circuit and now you can see that the 60 and the 40 are in series and the J80 ohms, and the negative J30 ohm impedance are in series as well. And the net is in parallel. That's written out here mathematically. So uh, applying the basic, uh, applying basic algebraic manipulation, you basically get the equivalent impedance. So that's the ZTH. Uh, th. Number one. Number two, to find I Norton, so basically, we have to find the short circuit current flowing through, flowing from A to B. But the simplest way to do this is actually to use mesh analysis. However, since uh, students don't seem to be familiar with mesh analysis, we'll just find the open circuit voltage and then say that the open uh, the Norton current is the open circuit voltage divided by the Thevenin impedance. Excuse me. So first, when this is open, if we use current divider, we can find I1, for example, as the other impedance divide by the total impedance times the input current. So that's what I1 is approximately. I2 is simply given by KCL. Therefore, by KVL, we can find VOC taking care of the signs uh, or being careful with the signs or being mindful of the signs. Uh, so VOC is approximately 134 at an angle of 123.425 degrees volts. And when we find I Norton, as VOC over ZTH, we'll actually find that I Norton is equal to this current. And it actually, if you did mesh analysis, you will find this out very quickly. But anyway, there it is. It's the Norton current, and that's the equivalent impedance. Therefore, the circuit, the Norton equivalent, is actually given by the Norton current uh, represented by independent current source in parallel with ZTH. So that's for this problem, problem number one. So for problem number two, let's see what the question is. It's basically to find the effective value for the waveform below, and that simply involves applying the mathematical definition of 
effective value or RMS value. And as usual, I'll pause the lecture, solve the problem, and then discuss it. All right, I'll be back. Okay, continuing. So this problem is actually very simple. It took me like around 20 seconds to solve this. And since here is the expression for the RMS value of a function, the square root of one over the period, integral over one period of the square of the function. And in this case, since we have straight lines, it's a very simple thing to square this function, number one. Number two, the integral, now the period of this function is four seconds, as you could see, and the integral is equivalent to finding the area. And since we have rectangular segments, it's pretty simple. Okay, let me mark this. This is, it's pretty simple once we square it, that's what we gotta be careful of, to find the area under these two segments as width times height. That's exactly what I've done here. The width is two seconds for both these segments. However, the height, remember you have to square so it's 100 and uh, uh, 100 for this guy, and for this guy it's going to be 400. So basically, the expression is going to be around is going to be exactly square root of 250 volts. Simplifying this, 200 plus 800 is 1,000. 1,000 divided by 4 is 250. And approximately, this fellow is going to be 15.81 volts. And I wrote this approximate value because now you can see that since RMS is the effective the DC value, the effective value is somewhere around there kind of makes sense because of the offset also, like in the sense the effective values are around there. So this problem is very simple. So now let's go on to the next problem, uh, which I believe is a very nice problem on complex power. It's a very good review of chapter 11. Excuse me. So as usual, I'll pause the lecture, solve the problem, and we'll discuss it. Okay, continuing. So this was a very nice problem. It took me around five minutes to solve. So we're going to determine the complex power for each of the following cases. Now the concept is the complex power which is measured in volt amps is given by VRMS bar times IRMS bar conjugate. Uh, excuse me, I, sorry about that, I had to like sneeze. But anyway, the complex power is given by VRMS bar times IRMS bar conjugate, which is in turn given by, well, if you expand this out, it's VRMS, IRMS, uh, cosine of theta V minus theta I. That is if you rewrite this in standard form, here it is. And the other concept we need is to visualize this in the form of a power triangle. And in this case, I've assumed theta V is greater than theta I. Or in other words, current lags voltage. So here it is. The magnitude of complex power is called apparent power. Here is the average power. And uh, this is the reactive power. Average power is measured in watts. Reactive power is measured in volt amps reactive. And complex power, uh, in this case, apparent power, Magnitude of complex power is also measured in volt amps. So the first question asks us, determine the complex power for the following cases. And for part A, remember you can write the complex power either in polar form or in standard form. And since it, both P and Q are given, and it's capacitive, so capacitive implies that current leads voltage. So theta I is greater than theta V. In other words, the imaginary part is going to be negative because you have sine of theta V minus theta I, and theta I is greater than theta V. So anyway, that's why I've drawn the power triangle like this. But the bottom line is, S bar is simply 269 minus, the minus sign is very, very important, J times 150 volt amps. So in this case, we didn't need to do any computations per se. We just had to be mindful of the negative sign. So that's why I put a smiley face. The solution to part A. For part B, well, he's given power factor of 0.9 leading. So we have to be a, a, we have to do a little bit of calculations. So again, I've drawn the power triangle in the correct orientation, if you will, determining on theta V and theta I. Remember, when he says, when we say leading, it's always with respect to current. So current, so lead lag is with respect to current. So current leads voltage means theta I is greater than theta V. So the Im imaginary part of the complex power is going to be negative. Anyway, it's a very simple matter to find cosine of theta V minus theta I from the definition of power factor, that is the ratio of, um, ah, it's the ratio of um, average power to uh, apparent power there. So theta V minus theta I is simply inverse cosine of 0.9. Well, basically we want theta V minus theta I is 25.84 degrees, and I'm going to write S, uh, S bar or complex power in standard form. So in this case, the real part is simply the average power, which is, for example, G 
given by 2000 over tangent of theta v minus theta i is exactly what this is uh, well approximately actually so it's 4129 minus j2000 volt amps so it's a solution to part b now for part c let's see what he's asking he's asking uh, so here the it, it's an inductive load if you will so theta v is greater than theta i he's given q he's given apparent power or the magnitude of complex power so in this case we have here is the power triangle drawn in the appropriate orientation in this case we have to find uh, um, average power and for finding average power i simply use the pythagorean theorem so this is what i get again notice that it's a plus sign now because theta v is greater than theta i in other words current lags voltage because i have an inductor and finally for the last part he's given vrms he's given the average power and he's given the magnitude of the impedance he's given that the load is actually inductive so again this implies current lags voltage or theta v is greater than theta i so first so first i've drawn the power triangle in the proper orientation having done that i can find the magnitude of the rms current and i'm going to use this to find apparent power which is the magnitude of complex power which gives me the length of the hypotenuse notice that very important i'm just dealing with magnitudes yes so here the magnitude of the rms current is simply given by the magnitude of the rms voltage divided by the impedance magnitude of the impedance i'm sorry which is equal to 5.5 amps and in this case the apparent power which is again as I mentioned, it's the magnitude of the complex power. It's given by VRMS times IRMS, well, the conjugate magnitude. But this is simply, the magnitude of the conjugate is simply the magnitude of the complex number. So here is the apparent power in volt amps. To find complex power, again, I've rep rep expressed complex power always in standard form. You could have represented it in polar form. But anyway, I apply the Pythagorean theorem again. And here is the answer. Notice again the all-important positive sign. Okay, Whew, that was a lot of fun. So that's about it for complex power. Next, we are going to solve a simple problem related to transformers. So as usual, I'll pause the lecture, solve the problem, and then we'll discuss it. Okay, continuing. So what we have here is I've re, I've drawn the circuit corresponding to the problem. So basically, here is our transformer. And we have a 60 at an angle of negative 30 uh, ohm impedance on the high voltage side, the input voltage side. And we have a 0.8 at an angle of 10 degrees ohm impedance on the secondary side, the low voltage side. So he's asking us to find the primary and secondary currents when the transformer is connected to 1200 volt RMS. So the central concept behind this is we have to understand that uh, the book defines the, uh, well, it's not a concept, the definition in the book is. Uh, the turns ratio is N2 over N1. And the central concept is we have to reflect the impedance on the secondary ZL, which is pointed at an angle of 10 ohms, onto the primary side. So the equivalent impedance, looking at the primary side, is the load impedance divided by N squared. But then N is defined as N2 over N1, which is V2, the secondary voltage, divided by V1, the primary voltage uh, rating on the transformer. So basically N is one-fifth. So the equivalent impedance is given by the load impedance divided by n squared n is one fifth so square this and caution that a common mistake committed by students is they forget the square so please don't forget the square so the equivalent impedance on the primary side is given by 20 at an angle of 10 degrees ohms so now it's a very simple matter to find the I primary as the input voltage divided by the equivalent impedance so here is the primary current and using the fact that this transformer is ideal that is the power uh, on the secondary is the same as the power in the primary and if you rewrite it in terms of currents we basically get the secondary current as n times ip and there is your secondary current so that's about it for this problem so what we'll do is as usual look at the next problem and then we'll discuss it or i'll solve the next problem and we'll discuss it okay continuing so here I've sketched the body plot. This took me around 10 minutes to do. First of all, I basically rewrote this in terms of J omega, and I carefully factored out 
the uh, poles of the transfer function of the roots of the denominator. So I get it in our standard form. So this is what I got. Uh, so notice that the gain, the DC gain, is less than one. So we have a, basically a negative 40 dB offset to all our body plots. So once I wrote it in the standard form, it's just then a matter of carefully plotting these uh, individual body plots on the semi-log paper. And as I told you on the exam, I will give you semi-log paper. So please get used to choosing the right frequencies and practicing plotting this. But basically, the constant is 0.01, so which is uh, 10 to the negative 2. So you have a negative 40 dB constant offset. This fellow, J omega, so it's all color-coded. And I also recommend for the final exam, you bring in uh, color pencil so you can clearly do this. It's I don't know a way to do body plots directly other than like plotting the individual components and then af graphically adding them. I mean, that's the point of using body plots. But anyway, J omega is a constant 20 dB per decade rise with a 0 dB crossing at 1 radians per second. Again, recall that on the omega scale, there is no omega going to 0 because that's a negative infinity. So anyway, here is the body magnitude plot of this fellow and then uh, just plotting these guys, the individual plots, and then graphically adding them means you initially have a shift of negative 40 dB uh, because of the con not initially, you have a shift of negative 40 dB because of the constant. So this fellow, uh, till 10 at 1 radians per second, uh, let's see. This gets, so I messed this up. Oh man, I got to pause this. Again, you got to be very careful. Like I have to offset this by negative 40 dB and I only offset it by negative 20 dB. So let me pause the lecture, fix that, and then go from there. So continuing, sorry about that goof up, uh, but again, this shows that you have to be mindful. So I was being mindful as I was explaining it to you. So anyway, the offset is a negative 40 dB. So at one radians per second, you're at negative 40 dB. You keep going up at 20 dB per decade because of this fellow. However, at uh, 10 radians per second, which is right there, this fellow starts acting up at negative 20 dB per decade. So you flatten out till 20 radians per second where you start going down at negative 20 dB per decade. And then the final pole starts acting at 40 dB at 40 radians per second. So you start going down at negative 40 dB per decade. So the black is the net body plot of our transfer function. And then finally, the phase plot is very similar. It's just that the constant is positive. So the, z the phase offset is zero degrees. From J omega, it's a simple phase offset of 90 degrees. And basically, you just add the phase offsets from these contributions and basically since you will have 90 degrees uh, from here 90 degrees from here uh, 90 degrees uh, from here eventually and it's all offset by 90 degrees so basically you start uh, eventually you should be at and I screwed this up as well ah, should be at negative 180 so let me uh, pause this and fix this okay continuing so I fixed a bug in the um, phase plot. But basically, I realized that at very high frequencies, you have a 270 degree contribution, negative 270, sorry, from these three guys. But then the 90 degrees from this fellow offset it to a net of negative 180. So there it is. But anyway, this is a very good problem for you to go through in terms of body plot uh, practice. Again, on the exam, I will give you semi-log paper. I'll expect you to use it. And I recommend that you bring in different colors. And uh, the point number three is the this will probably be the most complicated body plot that I'll ask you on the exam. Most likely the body plot on the exam will be simpler. I mean, this is not complicated, but on the exam, what I'll ask you is probably going to be simpler than this. Anyway, let's solve the last two problems and call it a lecture. I'm going to solve both of them at the same time because, I mean, both of them are in one recording stroke because they're pretty simple. Okay, continuing the last two problems. So the second last problem is design a series RLC circuit with this bandwidth, with this center frequency, and uh, the resistance is given. We also have to find the circuit's Q. So in order to do this, I mean, I assumed a band pass for it. You don't have to assume it because the bandwidth is simply given by R over L for a series RLC circuit. So since uh, the bandwidth is given and the resistance is given, the inductance is 0.5 Henry. We know the center frequency that gives us the capacitance. And Q can be easily found since we know omega naught and bandwidth as 50. 
the second last problem. So the final problem is also pretty straightforward in the sense he wants us to obtain the transfer function of a high pass filter with this passband gain of 10 and a cutoff frequency of 50 radians per second. So you hopefully know from all the practice and from your lab, etc., that the transfer function of a high pass filter with a corner frequency of 50 radians per second is given like so. Here is the gain in the passband. So the net transfer function is simply a product of these two gains. So you simply get this as the transfer function that we need. Now, if you want to design a circuit, here it is. It's uh, pretty straightforward. So here is the non-inverting amplifier with a gain of 10. You have a buffer to prevent loading. And here is our high pass filter. Whew. So that's about it for 2060. Hopefully you got a lot of conceptual understanding from this class. Good luck on the final and good luck in 2070 and all your future classes.